Lee knows how to dress. He's got three thermals on coming in here. Oh. It's just warm. This is true. We are going to talk about tonight charismatic exorcism versus biblical deliverance from devils. Amen. And the reason why is because that's where we're at. In the text where Paul is at this time, Paul is dealing with devil possess, uh, devil-possessed people. And uh, then there's some phony, what I call them phony charismatic exorcists that are there. Before I liken them to Roman Catholic exorcists, which is, is the same thing pretty much, same spirit. There isn't much difference. Okay, and they're going to cast out, they're going to pretend like these seven sons of Sceva, of one Sceva, they're, they're, gonna, they're going to attempt to use the name of Jesus as a talisman or as a incantation or as a spell, and they're going to find out that it doesn't work that way, right? That they have no authority. And we'll, we'll get into that and explain that to you here tonight and make the comparisons. And I'm going to say some things to you here tonight of, of just things that I've experienced in my own ministry and things like that that I, that I can tell you uh, how the devil works to try to distract and how to try to get you off of, of the main thing and, you know, that, that we need to be aware of that. And these, these seven sons of Sceva, they, they afford us the opportunity to be able to kind of look at that and see the comparisons there. Uh, wherever, like we talked about before, wherever there is the true, there is the counterfeit. They are always, they are always there, uh, a part of it. Acts 19, 13, then certain of the vagabond Jews, exorcists, took upon themselves, took upon them, excuse me, to call over them, which had evil spirits, the name of the Lord Jesus, saying, we adjure you by Jesus, whom Paul preacheth. And there were seven sons of one Sceva, a Jew, and chief of the priests, which did so. And the evil spirit answered and said, Jesus I know, and Paul I know, but who are ye? And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them, so that they fled out of that house naked and wounded. And this was known to all the Jews and Greeks also dwelling at Ephesus, and fear fell on them all, and the name of the Lord Jesus was magnified. Interesting, isn't it? What an account. Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you. We pray that you would just be with us now. Help us to rightly divide your word. Thank you so much for it. Thank you for feeding our souls. Thank you for the gospel. And Lord, if there be one or two here not saved, that they would know Jesus Christ, who is no life everlasting. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. This account of a phony exorcism, it affords us a wonderful example, and it shows us the same spirit of the modern-day deliverance ministries that are still with us today. By the way, these are like the Simon, Sor the Simon the Sorcerers and the modern-day deliverance ministries. The mo Let me tell you, I, I will emphatically say this to you, uh, as easily as, as simply as I can, uh, be it Russ Dizdar, who just died and probably went to hell, um, be it any of those other Bill Schnevelin, who I affectionately call the Schnevelator, um, uh, that guy or any of the other phony, charismatic, uh, deliverance, Pentecostal, uh, charismatic uh, deliverance ministries. They are, why are they false? Well, because they don't do it like the Bible says. That's why, number one. Their pattern is the scripture. Our pattern is the scriptures. Theirs are not the scriptures. They're like some really bad Hollywood horror film. That's how they treat devil possession or the thought of it or anything else like that. So that there are phony deliverance ministries should be no surprise to the child of God because you see them right here, right? Right? They even, they even took the name of, of Jesus, right? They even did that. The way these men creep in or crept in unawares and they soiled the churches with their putrid and false doctrine was foretold about. These modern-day exorcists, be they Roman Catholic or their brethren in arms, the charismatic movement which was started by Rome, they are all the same spirit of Antichrist. The mystics are Roman Catholics. All mysticism, all the mysticism and the teachings of mysticism today find their place in the seat of Rome. 
That's where they came from. You trace back the mystics, those that followed, the spiritists, those that followed those things. You trace them back to Roman Catholicism. And you could actually trace them back to the spirit of Babylon, which these vagabond Jews had. That's what these vagabond Jews were, right? Now, I've known men personally like these seven sons of Sceva. I've had them near me and even been persuaded by, uh, by the devil to be caught up in some of the hype of their phony deliverance and their phony deliverance examples. But having repented of such things and having the Lord sorely disciplined me to straighten me out, I can say that to you here tonight. I'm not ashamed of, of, of what, I'm ashamed that I failed God in some ways and that I was deceived in some ways. I'm not ashamed of admitting it. I'm not ashamed, why? Because there's power in that, in, 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 because, there's, because there's forgiveness with God, there is reason to fear Him, right? And because God is able to teach us from our mistakes more than from our victories at times. You know, we learn more from those. But, you know, God taught me not to be caught up in that showy deliverance ministry hype, because it isn't real at all. It's actually very dangerous. And by the way, what it does do it, it attracts devils. It attracts that demonic kingdom. It kind of pays homage to it, if you will. So number two, deliverance. I want to I make this point very clear to you because this is what we're talking about is deliverance. Deliverance is salvation. Or salvation is deliverance. We do not hold to the teachings that Christians can be possessed by devils. We reject that that teaching that that is out there we reject that emphatically and call on all men who hold such false doctrines and superstitions and her, that, that they are heretical and possibly lost men that have never truly been delivered of their sins the word deliverance means salvation by the way it is a salvation word when the son of man shall make you free you shall be free indeed when jesus cast out devils they stayed out and no more returned the men or women or children were delivered for good. But there are many charismatics today and closet ones at that, and they are not honest about their true beliefs, but they hold to charismatic doctrine. They infiltrate our Baptist churches and they teach other doctrines, and they do not teach sound doctrine purely. They teach that men can be saved and possessed. I've known these charismatic people to teach that Christians can be possessed. They also teach that... Christians must be sinlessly perfect, which is another false doctrine, because it's impossible. You won't be on this side. That is a present, that is a, or that is a future salvation. There, the future salvation that you and I have is that we will be delivered finally from this body of sin, and we will be free, free at last, Right? but we will be subject to this, the vanity of this life until we are gone. Amen. You know, I, I've seen, I, I've known these charismatic people to teach that Christians could be possessed. I've, I, I've heard and seen of them casting devils out of their own wives and children of professing Christians. You want to talk about confusing children. You want to talk about preaching and teaching confusion. Teach men and children that they can be possessed and still be saved people. What is that? That's confusion. Right? I've had men in this church like that before. That thought everyone needed, all, what everyone needed was, they were all possessed and they needed devils cast out of them. So they could be like them. Except you don't find that in the Bible. You don't find Christian people that are saved by grace having devils. Right. Ever. Anywhere. Now, let me say this. People have tried to take Paul's thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan, to buffet him as a sign of possession. And I asked them, really, do you believe that, huh? So Paul's affliction in the flesh was devil possession. Well, he asked the Lord thrice to remove it, and he said, My grace is sufficient for thee. In their perverse theories, Paul was possessed with a devil by God until he died. That is some messed up theology. Amen. Come on. Yeah. I, I probably wouldn't trust it, right? Right. Yeah, yeah, I wouldn't either. <laughs> right? Right, exactly. 
Or they believe when Jesus said to Peter in Matthew 16, 23, but he turned and said unto him, Peter, get thee behind me, Satan. Thou art an offense unto me, for thou savest not the things that be of God, but those that be of men. That he was saying that Peter was Satan, or Peter was possessed by Satan, and he wasn't. Satan was just right there. He never said that he was. The only man that has ever recorded that was near Christ like that, that, that was Judas, who was the son of perdition, who the Bible said, he says, I have lost none, save the son of perdition. Right? Right. Satan entered into him. Right. That was, that was the only one, and he never got saved. Where did he end up? Killing himself in his own place, right? He ended up in death. The moment that Satan entered him, he ran. Right. He couldn't stand being in the presence. Yeah, he didn't want anything to do with Jesus any longer. He was gone, right? So Judas was uh, the only one that, that we see like that. Then there's no Bible proof at all that Christians can be possessed by devils or any example of a Christian being possessed. Christians are called saved, they are called delivered, they are called redeemed, they are called regenerated, they are transformed, made new creatures in Christ Jesus. They are sealed under the day of redemption, they are given the earnest which is the Holy Ghost of God. And in Joel chapter 2 verse number 32 the Bible says this, And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. Okay, and where's the New Testament verse for that? Romans 10, 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. The Old Testament says delivered. The New Testament reference says saved. Why, why are they different? They're not. They're the same thing. Amen. To be delivered is to be saved. To be saved is to be delivered. That's what that means. Very clearly, the word is the same. And that's the work of Christ. That's what he does. Now, the next, the, the number three, point number three, why couldn't the seven sons of Sceva cast devils out? Well, number one, they didn't have the right authority. In Acts 19, 19, 13, it says they took upon themselves, right? If you look at Acts chapter 19, you look at verse number 13, took upon them. They took upon themselves. By the way, they, they not only took upon themselves, they took upon themselves to call over devils, which was really stupid. Um, but these seven sons, they took it upon themselves. They were not sent by God. They were not saved men who love the Lord. They are men. They are, there are many men today, be it politically or spiritually, that they really have a desire to do something right and help others, but they're not born again. And Satan and his devils mop the floor with them. I believe there are men and women for that matter that go to Washington, DC. And I believe they really want to do something good. I think they do. I think they have noble intentions, right? I think there are men that do that. But what happens? They want to drain the swamp, but the swamp has never been drained from their own hearts. So how can they? They can't. They go and they get right. ate up by the Come system. They get, right. they get drowned by the swamp. Right. And then they become a swampy. Right? right? That's, what they, that's, that's what they become, right? That's the way it goes. I think I like one of Baxter's and Spurgeon's first chapters in their helps to pastors or lectures to my students. They say, take heed to yourself, meaning make sure that you're born again before you try to serve God, before you try to do the service of the king. I remember back 20 years ago, before over 20 years ago, before I was saved, I remember trying to preach to junior church, you know. I, I'd, I'd been in the world and I had made money. I had been able to run businesses. I had been able to do all that kind of stuff. So I just thought, you know, okay. So I went back to church, so now it's time for me to... You know, yeah, do, yeah, do the church thing. And I mean, I had good intentions, some of them, <laughs> but uh, some of them were good. But what happened? I didn't have the power of God. I wasn't saved by the grace of God. Right. I thought I could just preach and do the Lord's work. I didn't truly know that I was a lost man at that time. Then the Lord began to show me and humbled me through the preaching of the cross. He began to humble me to show me that I wasn't saved, that I had to be born again. I remember being a fake back then, and now just the fear of not being right with God can cause me to shrivel up and think, oh my goodness, I could never go out there and preach fake now that I'm saved or not right with God and not, not have, you know what I mean? I, I couldn't do it now. Why? Because I have the Holy Ghost of God in me, and I don't want to do it, right? That was the difference. Like, I, I couldn't do it now like that. Years when I had my, you know, um, 
bout with depression and the things that happened to me years ago. I was brought down so low that I was so afraid. I, I couldn't even hardly preach. Right? But God is faithful. Amen. So you will not take it upon yourself to cast out devils, even as saved men and women. If you believe you can fight Satan willy nilly, he'll deceive you and God Almighty will let him give you a whipping too. I'll tell you that right now. If you play games, God's way is still this way. The seven sons of Skibo found out real quick that God's way is serious. What's God's way? Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil and he will flee from you. Draw nigh to God and he'll draw nigh to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Amen? That's God's way. You submit yourself, therefore, to God first. Then you're able to resist the devil. Then you're able to fight the devil. That's God's way. If you don't do that, if you don't resist, or if you don't submit to God first, you ain't never fighting the devil. You will get ate up, especially in, in, in casting out devils and messing around with things like that. You'll definitely be in trouble. And, of course, these men weren't even saved. They didn't have any authority at all. But I'm, I'm warning you that, likewise, if God's people aren't submitted to God, and you try a warring, you just go ahead and try to live your life. You got, I don't, it doesn't matter what it is. If you're a child of God and you're not living right with God right now, if you're not living right, and you see problems in your family, problems in your home, problems in different areas of your life, and you think you're going to fight the devil, you think you're going to fight against that stuff when you're not living right, when you're not walking with God, when you don't have daily devotion with God, when you're not crying out to God, when you're not, when you're not submitting yourselves there before to God, you're going to get ate up. And God will see to it that you do. Because God won't let disobedient children be victorious. I'm going to say that again to you. God will not let disobedient children be victorious. He won't. If they're disobedient, he will let them take their weapons, And you'll keep taking them, too. And you'll keep getting them, too, until you want to get right with God. He'll never. God doesn't have any bastards. He has sons. And he'll make sure you don't act like a little bastard. You understand me? I'm being clear with all of you. I'm saying that very clearly. God will make sure that you're not act, running around acting like a little bastard if you're his. He ain't going to put up with that. God ain't going to let you act like that. You don't get to go act any old way you want to. I was encouraged today. I... Uh, I was driving a Bronco. I went into, that's not why I was encouraged, but uh, <laughs> I was, it was kind of fun though. But I, but I, <laughs> I was with Dave today and, uh, and I said, hey, let's go take that Bronco for a ride. And he said, okay. And I, I just wanted to drive it to see what it was like because I used to own a Wrangler. So I was like, I'm going to drive this thing and see what it's like. Man, I got to tell you, I'm pretty impressed with that Bronco. I, I think you'd be impressed with that Bronco. And you're a stale old Chevy guy, and I think you'd actually be impressed with, <laughs> with something new like that. But anyway, no, I'm just kidding. But uh, you'd, I think you'd like it, though. Seriously, you should drive it. It's fun. Uh, but the point is, I was sitting there, and somebody called Dave on the phone. It was a customer that he had seen uh, two months ago. And he's talking to them on the phone, and they said, and they said some things, and I, I thought... It was a blessing to hear, as his pastor especially, it was a blessing to hear because I'm sitting next to him. And the, the, the man said, you know what, I, my wife and I, we really appreciated you. Two months ago, you showed us a Maverick, this, this truck. You showed us this truck, and we really liked it. We, and we really liked you, but we hated the color. <laughs> so they were like, we really hated that color, but you were kind to us. You explained things to us. You were thoughtful, and you, you walked us through everything, and we're really appreciative of it the way you handled yourself and the way you, you conducted yourself. And, I mean, two months later, they're calling him back, right? That's his testimony. That's the testimony that he left with those people. By the way, as much as lieth in you, live peaceably with all men, right? We ought to try to have, it should be, you know, I mean, it's not always going to be that way, but for the most part, we should try to have that. We should, you know, in work, I was thinking about Jacob. Uh, didn't you get uh, trucker of the month, right, or something like that? Is that what it's called? Driver. Driver sorry. Trucker of the month. <laughs> he just needs a Tonka hat on. One of those. <laughs> but trucking with Jake. But uh, right. And, and, and I listened to all of your different testimonies of, of just your work and promotions that you've gotten and things that you've done. And, and there's other men here that have been through those things and, and, and that, have, that, have, that have excelled at those things. And it's, it's a blessing to hear that, that 
Why? Because it means that you actually do want to. It's a rarity in this world now for people just to help others and, and do their job and do it right. Right. What's that? And be genuine. Yeah. Just be real. I don't care if you have to. Sometimes you have to tell people. I'll get you. Uh, sometimes you have to tell people the truth. You know, you just are you just have to tell them plainly the truth and tell them all and just let them have it. And just be like, well, this is the way it is. I'm sorry. Right. And that means a lot. That's important. It's important for a child of God that he's submitted to God, that he has a desire to do that. That should be your desire in this world. All of us. Right. That we would live right. You know, that God, God wants us to do that, to be submitted to him. You know, these Jews, they were gypsies. They were vagabonds. They were gypsy Jews that were running around into witchcraft and into they, they found a way to make money on uh, casting out devils. And they were having obviously they had had some success with it because people sought them out. Right. They were sought out to cast these this devil out of this man. And when they got there, um, they had heard, obviously, about the success, because if you look at the verses preceding, Paul had great success in casting out devils, healing the sick, and preaching the gospel. And they wanted in on it, so they just listened and said, okay, I think I got that incantation down. I heard what Paul just said. He just said in the name of Jesus, right? So what do all the charismatics do? Same thing. You hear them up there, they, they say it, they'll say it over and over again. They'll like, they'll like rub people's head and be like, Jesus, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus, yes, yes, Jesus, yes, Jesus. And they're just like rubbing, they're just rubbing, and, and they're, that's their mantra. That's their little incantation. That's what that is. They even talk about invoking Yes, that's exactly what they do. It's an invocation. That's what it is, and they admit it, that that's what it is, right? Your head okay, Malachi? <laughs> you just got all kinds of anointing on you just now. <laughs> I'm just kidding. <laughs> There's too much anointing in this room, man. <laughs> but these men, they saw Paul being used of the Lord to deliver men from devils, and they wanted to do it, like Simon the sorcerer wanted to do it. They found a new spell that would work, so they wanted to try it out. They were just gypsies that took upon themselves the profession of casting out devils, Roman Catholic style, before it was cool, right? So perhaps Satan gave them some success before and let devils come out to play games and to toy with them and lead them along. Satan doesn't care what deceives man as long as he doesn't have the truth. These men attempted to do God's work without his spirit and without his power, without the gospel. You see, it's Jesus that saves and has the power to deliver. It's his gospel. The gospel is the power of God unto salvation. The gospel is it. You say, how do you, how does a man get delivered from demons? He repents and believes the gospel and that demon's gone. That devil's gone. Yeah, it's gone. Gone, done, gone, gone. You really believe that? Yeah, I really believe that. I, I really believe that. That's right. I absolutely do. I believe it's that simple too. Number two, they didn't have the right relationship. They didn't have, what, what did he say in verse number 14? Jesus whom Paul preacheth. Those who use the name of Jesus must know him personally through repentance and faith. It's a personal relationship with Jesus Christ. Jesus spoke of those who cast out devils, but he didn't even know them. In Matthew, in Matthew chapter 7, verse number 21, right? He said, I never knew you. Depart from me. I never knew you. They never communed with the Lord. They never had a relationship with God. They never cried out to Christ in repentance and faith in him. They never sought his face. They never cared about him. They just used his name as some magic word, right? Supposing that gain is godliness. This speaks to us about what we said above. Is your soul saved? You can't fight Satan if you're lost. But now it speaks to us of yet deeper things, though that the true ministers of God and the true saints of God are known by the devils. You, you, there's a whole entire, I'm not trying to scare you tonight, but I, I'm, I'm here to tell you that there's a whole kingdom of devils out there that knows exactly who you are. They, they know exactly who you are. Absolutely. They, they know exactly who you are. And that's why they put temptations in your way. And that's why they know how to tempt you. Because the Bible calls them familiars and things like they watch. They're familiar with your actions. Why? Well, because they want to bring you down. 
And yes, it's your own depravity that you have to answer for. I'm not, I'm not giving any man any excuse tonight. I don't believe in the demon of, uh, of overeating Cheetos or, or uh, right? Or the demon of whiskey or any of that stuff. I believe there's devils out there, and I believe they tempt you with your own depravity. That's what I believe. And I believe, it's very, I believe the Bible says that, and I believe it's very, it's very simple. They, they know how, they, we give them all the ammo they need sometimes to, to make those temptations worse, right? By our actions in our lives. Jesus, I know, they said. Yes, they knew him. When they cry out, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. They knew who Jesus was. I've had possessed people look at me many years ago and say things like, they, that they could never know about, about me. But turn to me and say things like, well, we can't do anything to you, but your children aren't saved. Oh, yeah. Do you think they meant it? Oh, yeah, I think they meant it. <laughs> of course. Like, I mean, we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. I mean, you believe that, right? You, you still believe that, right? I remember that when my children were very little. I, I, I've told you that story before, though, about that devil-possessed person. But... Um, I remember I made some, by the way, you make a charismatic man that's full of devils and witches, and they like to cause trouble. And they can, they can cause some trouble, only as much as God allows them to. By the way, Satan's allowed to cause you trouble sometimes. He's allowed to do that. His devils are allowed to do that sometimes. Right? I remember some little psycho witch that pretended to be a Christian casted a curse on me and a spell. He said... He said, I, he said this church wouldn't, be, wouldn't make it another three years. That was ten years ago. Amen. God's good, ain't he? <laughs> ah, made them look like fools, didn't he? Satan is always after the little ones, by the way. That's why you and I have a duty to protect them from the devil. And children, you are protected by God's grace. And if you go to him and you trust him as your Lord and Savior, confessing you're a lost sinner on your way to hell, he'll save your soul and give you, give you the Holy Ghost of God. He is a faithful high priest that ever liveth to make intercession for you. Amen. You see, devils know the, the preachers too. Now, they not only knew Jesus, but they knew Paul. They knew who Paul was. They knew exactly who he was. Jesus I know and Paul I know. Remember, Satan knows the ones who are the Lord's. He knows God's men. And I believe like Spurgeon that all God's true pastors, they're going to stand toe-to-toe -to -toe with Satan sometime. They're going to have that encounter. No, it's not going to be a, a visual encounter. You're not going to see him, thank God. You wouldn't want to see him anyway. You'd be scared to death if you did. I don't believe you would. Think about uh, Elijah's servant when, he was, when, when God showed him all this, the true angels of God, right, that were, that were there in the host. You know, that was a, an experience. But if you saw... If you and I saw all the devil's kingdom around us or Satan himself, that would, that would be a terrible thing to see, right? We wouldn't want to see that. But they're there. We know it because the Bible tells us that, right? And I understand what that means to take the, that, that that battle that took place. Uh, <laughs> and I understand that the effects of it I still face today sometimes. But I can say this, my anchor holds. God's never failed me. God's never failed me once. He's never let me sink down into so much despair that, that, he could, that, that I was never beyond it, that he could not lift me up and bring me out of it, right? And teach me to trust him in the dark, right? To trust him in the darkest times, just trust the Lord. Amen? Amen. Christ has proven to be more than enough. His grace is sufficient. He only, he only allows the devil to go so far and no further. Number three, they used the, the name of Jesus as a spell or a lucky charm. They were attempting to use the name of Jesus as a magic charm. And by the way, this has been done many times since then. For example, some people use crucifixes, right? Rosaries, 
holy water. Oh, Joy was telling me a story about how they did that holy water. That is some weird stuff, man. But she, she, said, she was telling me that because she was a Carmelite in the Carmelite nun order. She wasn't, she, I don't think she went all the way through it, but she was in it. And, and she told me the stories of how they did that. Boy, that is some twisted, weird stuff. They are some weirdos. But uh, they're, they're definitely the biggest, they're, they're, they are the occult. They are the, they are it. But um, anyway, she, they, they use all these things in an attempt to ward off evil spirits and to bring good luck. Think about the Catholics, use it, the Hindus and others use those, those rosaries the same way. It's all witchcraft. All it is is witchcraft. Yeah, it's the same spirit. Muslims do it too. They have, and they pray to Mary too. They, they, it's all witchcraft. But see, think about it this way. Wait a minute. Now, by the way, some of you understand, will understand what I'm saying here. Before you were saved and before, or before you were sanctified, some of us were saved and still watched some things, but, but before you were walking with the Lord and understood things about Hollywood and all those other things, do you remember that every single movie that deals with exorcism always has a Catholic priest? It's always the Catholic priest with the holy water and the crucifix. It's always him. Right. Yeah, exactly. And the smoky opium shaker. Right? Right? The Catholics, they use the holy water, right? The charismatics pronounce things in Jesus' name all the time. I've, I've been on the street and those little charismatic witches will rebuke you in Jesus' name and we're like, yeah. You don't have any authority to do that, whatever. While they preach their phony Jezebel devilish love to sodomites who, har who are hardening their sin. Remember those guys? Remember those, remember those people that were out there? Were out there preaching over there? Yeah. And the two charismatics came up? And they're preaching, telling the sodomites that Jesus loves them and they can stay sodomites and God loves you just the way you are? Just, hey, they basically said, they basically said, stay gay, right? It's basically what they said to them. And said that we were wrong for preaching the Bible to them, right? I've had many charismatics curse me, but also try to use Jesus' name and come in Jesus' name. And all they are are the seven sons of Sceva playing exorcism games. These charismatics, they do the same thing that these seven sons of Sceva do. They hold on night, night deliverance sessions and attempt to cast out different devils. It's mostly depravity, not the devil. And you can't cast out depravity. depravity. You've got to be washed in the blood. You've got you to have a new nature given to you. right? You're not going to cast out depravity. There are some people that are trying to cast out devils. You don't need to cast out devils. You need to get saved by the grace of Almighty God. And you need to walk in the Spirit because you're going to have that sin nature with you until you're gone. Don't you be blaming the devil for your own sin. That's how, that, that's how you become a victim. You ain't no victim. You're victorious. When you're saved by the grace of God and you have the Holy Ghost of God, you don't get to walk around and be a victim. You're a victor in Christ. You've been given victory. You don't get to walk around and act like you're some beat up little puppy dog. When you've been saved by grace, you're victorious. You're a victor, not a victim. God doesn't want his children ever acting like that. Like I had some charismatic that told me when I was at the state fair, right, with my family that he had written a prayer. He said, I could say it if I wanted to ward off any devils and curses that were in my generations and my family. And all I need to do is just say this crafted prayer that he had. I said, get out of here, you little devil. Beat it. Get out of here. I don't need your little, I don't need your little incantation. I don't need your little spell. I've been saved by grace. When, it, when I walked up to him, he said he could see God in my face. When he left, he said, you look like the devil. <laughs> well, that was kind of confusing. Which one is it? <laughs> I just kind of laughed. I just kept eating my popcorn. Just another charismatic witch. They find me everywhere. I mean, there's crowds of 10, 000, 10, uh, hundreds of thousands of people there, and he goes, oh, that guy. Let me go talk to him. <coughs> right? 
right? You see, they use Jesus' name like the Jews did and the Catholics do, false exorcism to cast out devils. And what they do is attract devils. What they do is enslave men the more. And Satan can attack the flesh of a saved person. We see that in Job. If you, if you mess around in areas that God doesn't want you to, and if you leave the plain path of duty and, don't get, and you're not right with God, God will allow Satan to be a chastening tool. Absolutely. Charismania, you know, but that's not what God, that's not what God says casting out devils is. That's not what God says, but exorcism teaches you that that's, so you, the, all these people call themselves as deliverance ministries and exorcists and all these other things. And the Roman Catholic Church recently, I saw an article, not recently, but like six months ago or a year ago or something like that. They talked about how they're hiring more exorcists. Like, in vast numbers of exorcisms, like, wow, they want to, like, give people devils, right? By the way, your Christian life isn't summed up by, by preaching outside of uh, occult bookstores or outside of where witches are or anything like that and trying to preach them. You know, Paul didn't have to go look for witches. Paul didn't go to their front door and go preach to them like that. Paul just went and preached, and they found him. They'll find you. If you're preaching the Bible, they'll find you. What's that? Or the bookstores, that's right. You preach the word anywhere and all the witches come out. You preach it down the street right here. You preach it over there. They're, they're all going to be there. Right? These gypsy Jews took it upon themselves, though, to call over them which had evil spirits. They went looking for the devils. You're not supposed to do that. They went looking for them to seek them out. Looking to make the devil mad is not a good idea. Not that way. Preaching the gospel is fine. Looking to make the devil mad in that way, you might just, God might just let you have it. Our business is the gospel, not some freak show or casting out devils. Our business is to preach the word. That's our business. Not some bad episode of Poltergeist, right? Not some bad horror movie, which always shows uh, somebody casting out devils and green slimes flying out of their throats and all kinds of other things. We're not Scott Johnson looking for black-eyed children chasing Bigfoots through woods with 21-foot walls of fire aiming our prayer bazookas at people. <laughs> that was clear. See my video on strong spiritual warfare? In cartoon form? And I aim my prayer at him. <laughs> Nor do we need the sacred name charismatics like Bill Schneblin who runs uh, deliverance ministries that are influencing, by the way, many people out there. And they go to those men and they, those men preach and they say they're going to deliver people from their devils and all that kind of stuff. And they go out there and say, well, you got to say the name of Jesus right, though. You can't say Jesus. Right? You gotta say the sacred name right, and you gotta go back to the Hebrew, and you gotta you sound like one of the seven sons of Sceva. Yeah, That's what you sound like. Right? I think it's all a bunch of nonsense. Wearing long robes and playing peekaboo with his wife in the woods somewhere, showing those pictures off like this while they're all in the woods with his long robes down to beard down to here, and him and his wife hiding behind trees and taking pictures of it all and acting like they're, I don't know, doing something super spiritual. I, it was just weird. Saying that you, the same men that say, same, same men saying that they, they sat on their couch one day and they sat there and, and Jesus and the Holy Spirit came in or something like that, two angels, right? They came in and they walked in and they sat down and had a conversation with them. Hmm. Really? They're the seven sons of Sceva. They don't offer deliverance. They offer bondage. The Bible says very clearly, when the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. You know, here's the thing. You don't need years of going back and telling all your deep, dark sins and confessing every sin you ever committed and everything you ever did wrong, searching for why you should be possessed or anything like that, and having to go, listen, I'm going to be very clear with you here again, okay? So there are people that have suffered satanic ritual abuse and they've suffered everything else, right? I'm going to give them the same answer that I gave, that I would give a child in here that is 
seven or eight or ten or however years old that needs to be saved. Believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's the simple answer. Jesus Christ maketh thee whole. That's the simple answer. You don't need years of counseling. You don't need years of figuring out how bad your mom and dad was, how bad everything else was, what every little thing that ever happened to you in your life, and you got to drum up everything else, and you got to go to the, the core of when you were possessed and how it happened and all these other things. This is what these deliverance ministries teach. And you don't understand. It takes a lot of time to get that devil out of them and to, and to help them and to do this and to do that. You know what they need? They need God's plan. They need the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, and they need a local New Testament church to serve God in. Amen. They don't need to be playing stupid chick book comic games out there acting like that's the real world. And that's just the truth of it. That's why I don't like a lot of that nonsense anymore. I just, I don't like it anymore. I don't like a lot of the chick track stuff because you read the comic books and everything else and they turn this, 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 uh, this Christian life into some kind of crusader novel. It's not a crusader novel. You're going to wake up every day and if you want to serve God, the greatest thing you're going to fight is the man in the mirror every Amen. single day. It isn't going to be some devil coming after you. It's your own depravity coming after you. It's your own heart that has to be put down. Right? You can blame. You, you. Listen, you can make all the excuses in the world for how you were raised, what happened to you, the, thing, the bad things that happened to you and everything else, or you can stand up and you can trust Jesus Christ and you can press on and serve the Lord. Right. I'm sorry that bad things happened to you, but you know what? Get over it. Say, you can't say that. Oh, yes, I can. I just did. I'll say it again, too. Why? Because it isn't going to help you to sit there and fret about the past. It isn't going to help you to sit there and, and go back and look at all those other things. That's what these deliverance ministries do. We've got to figure out when. And the same people saying they're werewolves. And, and uh, Brother Paul knew a werewolf once. No, was that a werewolf, Paul? Was that what that was? Somebody told you there was a werewolf? Was it right? Somebody told you it was a werewolf, right? I think it was, wasn't it? Howling at the moon. <laughs> Some people's kids. Um, <laughs> right? You're either a werewolf or a vampire. I met one of those, and they didn't like to. They were a loser by day and a loser by night, actually. Um, a what's that? Loser 24. Loser 20, that's right. That's right. That's right. So, yeah. Hmm. Interesting. Um, right. The answer for the person who suffered as a child or suffered anything else is repent and believe the gospel. The, the answer is the power of the gospel. Those men that believe men need to go through exorcism, they're still in bondage. You take it to the Lord in prayer. You don't understand, preacher. I had dancing devils and orbs of light surrounding my head and, and all kinds of... Well, I'm sorry. But... Right, right. <laughs> My grandpa was Aleister Crowley and everything else. Well, that's unfortunate. But, le, but, le, <laughs> ah, this is too much. Uh, but hey, what do you expect? Five years later. Um, but uh, praise the Lord, it doesn't matter who your grandpa is. It matters who your father in heaven is. It matters who you trust with your never dying soul. That's what it matters today. That's the simplicity of Christ. And you know what, God, one of the first things God, God taught me and showed me very plainly after he whooped my hide and allowed me to get beat up by the devil a bit, one of the first things he showed me is, you left the simplicity that I sent you on. You left it. And you're going to go back to it. And you're going to love it. And you're going to desire it, and you're going to want it more than anything. And I like the fact that, I, that, that things are simple. I like the fact that things are simple tonight. I like the fact that there is no confusion with that. It's very simple. It's the simplicity that's in Christ. I don't care who you are or what place you're at, whether you're a child that was nine years old that was possessed by devils, whether, whether you were molested, whether you were treated horrible, whether, whether you were a sodomite, whether you were whatever, whatever, it doesn't matter. Whatever it is, if the Son of Man shall make you free, you shall be free indeed. See, I preach the gospel. If you got devils tonight, then you need Jesus. You just need Jesus. 
That's the answer. You need to trust Christ. You don't need anybody uh, popping hands on you. You don't need anybody doing any ceremonies over you. You don't need any of that. What you need to do is bow your head, cry out to Jesus Christ, ask him to forgive your sins and save your soul, and believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. And believe him, and you'll be delivered. Why? Because Jesus promised it. That's why. That's the promise of God. The power of the gospel. Trusting Jesus, that is all. Simply trusting. Right? Jesus is my answer. The gospel is my answer. I need no other argument. I need no other plea. It is enough that Jesus died and that he died for me. It is enough. It is. Amen? It is. I, I don't care what it is tonight. It doesn't matter what it is. It doesn't matter. It doesn't, wherever anybody is under the sound of my voice that ever hears this anywhere, and they say, you don't understand, my parents were witches and this, well, well, call out to Jesus Christ. Well, it's not that simple. Oh, yes, it is. Oh, it is that simple. It is that simple, friend. It is that simple. It is that simple. I... That's why I can understand it, because it's that simple. That's why that little six-year-old can understand it. That's why a ten-year-old will understand it. Right? That's why an old slave could understand it. That had no education or nothing else, but someone preached Christ and him crucified to him. That uh, Gowan pamphlet that was saved under the ministry of, uh, I think it was James Ireland, but I can't remember. That black preacher down south. He was a slave. He couldn't read or write. Some of those men couldn't read or write. I don't know if he could or not, but some of those men couldn't even read or write or anything else. But somebody told them, Jesus will forgive your sins and save your soul. And they believed him. They believed on Jesus. God taught me that. You, you know, you, you leave the simplicity, you're going to be in trouble. God didn't call anybody in this room to be an exorcist, but a preacher of the gospel. Well, you tell me you have devils, I'm going to say, okay, we're going to pray for you. <laughs> we're going to pray for you, and you need to be saved. That's your answer. Oh, well, but you've got to get the devil out first before they get saved. Oh, Jesus will get the devil out all right. You just look unto Jesus. He, he's the one that gets it out, not me or you. He'll get it out. You just turn to him. You think it's that simple? No, I know it's that simple. I don't think it's that. Let me, let me be clear with you. I don't think it's that simple. I know it's that simple. I know it is. That's the gospel we preach. That's the power of God unto salvation. Right? That's right. You know, I find that you and I should fear the depravity of our own hearts more than we do the devil. We should take all of it to the Lord in prayer, though. In his arms he'll take and shield thee. Thou wilt find a solace there. Oh, I can't, I, I'm telling you tonight, I don't care what it is, I can't give you anything else but Jesus. There's nothing else that you need. There's nothing else that's the need of the hour. You can sit around and you can wonder. Uh, by the way, some of you are struggling with assurance of your salvation. Well, that's because you need to look to Jesus. That, that's because you need to look to him. You need to stop looking at you and you need to look at him. Well, I don't know why you're looking at you. You're like looking at a ball of hell with legs walking around. That's what we're all like looking at. If you keep looking at hell, yeah, you're going to be afraid. That's why you got to look to Jesus. You got to you got to put your eyes on him. By the way, the same one that led you to repentance and faith is the same one that keeps you. He's the same one that keeps you. Why? Cuz there's no way you could keep yourself. You're not able to keep yourself. But he is able. He is able to keep you. And by the way, he isn't keeping you because you're a great person. We're rotten as hell. He's keeping us because he's a great person. <laughs> Amen. He's keeping us because he's great. He's keeping us because God is love. That's why he's keeping us. He's keeping us because of his righteousness. He changes not. He doesn't change. I'll put it this way. God hasn't changed his mind about you. 
God, God doesn't change it. What? Well, you, you must, you, well, I sinned, so he must have. I failed God, so he, he must have. No, God don't love you like you, you love other people sometimes. When people wrong you, you're done with them. You don't want nothing to do with them. God didn't like that. Right? God has the same, same love as a mother has. Or a mother has the same love that God has in that sense. Like, they, they never, you're, I mean, you could be a mass serial killer and your mother's like, oh, he's a good boy. And he ain't no good boy. He killed people. Oh, he's a sweet boy. He ain't no sweet boy. He's a little devil. Right. But that's how. But but God says when God looks at you and you've been and, and you trusted Christ as your savior, he looks down at you and he says, well, my son, my son's blood is on him. Right. And I and I love them. With an everlasting love. That never changes. Because God's love is not some emotional girlfriend boyfriend love God's love is a legal binding eternal love that's what it is God he doesn't change because his nature doesn't change like okay so in other words what I'm trying to explain to you is is that God isn't fickle like he doesn't changes feelings like some days you wake up and you feel bad God never feels that way because God's not that way <laughs> right I, I you wake up and maybe as a mom and you're like oh my goodness I don't think I can do this today oh my goodness don't touch me right Okay, go sit over there, please. Uh, I'll get your breakfast. <laughs> right? Right? God isn't like that. Right? <laughs> it's funny, isn't it? Yeah, I know. How do I know that? <laughs> but, but God isn't like that. God loves you always. God doesn't change. Like, he doesn't change. Your circumstances change, and God's love grows through your circumstances. Your love grows for God and will grow. You'll learn to trust him like I told you before. These seven sons of Sceva, Sceva, the devil overcame them and hurt them badly. The devil possessed man overcame them and injured them. You will notice that that man leaped on them. And the man in whom the evil spirit was leaped on them and overcame them and prevailed against them so that they fled out of the house naked and wounded. wounded. So one man overcame seven men one man how is that he had a devil devils are powerful they give power to burst chains and fetters and not to be held down it's superhuman strength that's not of this world these devils stripped them down naked they were not afraid of those rogue jews summoning up someone else's god even though the name of jesus has power but it's authority that matters. I want to explain that to you here, okay? Uh, turn to John 14. I'm going to take you through some scriptures, and we're going to be done here. John 14. I'm working overtime here tonight, but I don't charge time and a half. I just want you to know that. What's that? I don't even charge double time. It's just I get du you get doubly blessed and so do I. I'm working for my retirement in heaven. <laughs> One day. John 14, 13. And whatsoever you shall ask in my name, that will I do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you shall ask anything in my name, I will do it. John 15, 7. If ye abide in me and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that you bear much fruit, so shall you be my disciples. John 15, 16. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you, and ordained you, that you should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain, that whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. 
John 16, 23. And in that day you shall ask me nothing. Verily, verily, I say unto you, whatsoever you shall ask the Father in my name, he will give it you. Hitherto have ye asked nothing in my name. Ask, and you shall receive, that your joy may be full. Hitherto, uh, excuse me, these things have I spoken unto you in Proverbs, but the time cometh when I shall no more speak unto you in Proverbs, but I shall show you plainly of the Father. At that day you shall ask in my name, and I say unto you that I will pray the Father for you, for the Father himself loveth you. Do you understand that? Look what that says here tonight. For the Father himself loveth you. Because you have loved me and have believed that I came out from God. You believe that, don't you? You believe that Jesus came out from God, don't you? I came forth from the Father and am come into the world. Again, I leave the world and go to the Father. Listen, asking something in Jesus' name is asking in his authority. It's authority. It's, it's an authority issue. Just like baptizing, people say, have you been baptized in Jesus' name? Yeah. Through his local New Testament church? Yes, when we're baptized, yeah. It's not some saying that you have to do. It's not some incantation. I do say that. There's nothing wrong with saying it, right? Baptize in the name of the Father and the Son of the Holy Ghost. There's nothing wrong. But if I didn't say it, you'd still be baptized in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Right, because it's the power and the authority of God. That's what that means. That's all that means. It doesn't mean, any, it doesn't mean that those words have to be pronounced at a baptism for it to be legitimate. That's not, that, doesn't, that doesn't mean that at all. It, that's, it isn't the words that do that. It's the authority. Well, where's the authority come from? The Great Commission. He said, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature, baptizing them in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost, Amen. teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you, and lo, I am with you all, wait, even at the end. Amen. Amen. That's right. That's what it is. That's the commission. See how simple it is? What is that? Well, who do you, you baptize. You baptize the name of Jesus. You bet I do. That's what God said. It's his authority. When you cast out devils, if you were to cast out a devil, if there was a devil like that, you would do it by the authority of Christ. You see what I mean? That's what that means in the name of. It means by the authority of. It's an authority issue. So when you pray, right? When you pray and you ask God to give you something, right? If it ain't under Jesus' authority, God ain't going to give it to you. That's what that means. God won't give it to you. Why? Because if it's bad for you, God won't give it to you because Jesus didn't authorize it. People, think about this way. Paul, Paul says that he prayed thrice to the Lord that that thorn would be removed from him, right? And God didn't do it. Well, he prayed in Jesus' name. Well, of course he did. But it wasn't according to his will. If anything is according to his will, he heareth us. If it's God's will. You don't, you and I don't change God's will. <laughs> But prayer is God's will. Do you understand that? It is God's will that you and I pray. That is God's will. Right? Prayer changes things on earth. It changes nothing in heaven. Right? Because forever, O Lord, forever, O Lord, thy word is settled in heaven. Right? Everything. God knows what's going to happen, but he uses prayer. You better believe he does. They're part of his plan. That's why you're supposed to pray. By the way, that's why there's strength in prayer. That's why there's deliverance in prayer. That's why there's power in prayer, because it's God's way. It's God's plan, right? God's plan is prayer, Amen. and you're to pray, right? You're to pray and seek God's face. God knew that it wasn't his will for that thorn in the flesh to be removed from Paul. So he didn't remove it. There may be some things you want God to remove right now. You want God to take you out of and God says no. That doesn't mean you stop praying. You pray till God shows you and gives you the direction that he wants you to go. And he will. He'll either grant your request or he'll put you on, some, uh, on a different course. <laughs> but he will answer. Right? See, these seven sons of Sceva, they had no authority to do what they were doing. They wanted to do cheap parlor tricks like Simon the Sorcerer. Devils are real and powerful, but they don't have authority over the true believer. 
We are instructed to put on the whole armor of God so that we can resist the devil. You know, the devil's kingdom is powerful, but we've been given armor to fight. Right? We've been given the sword of the spirit, which is the word of God. We've been given the shield of faith, the helmet of salvation, feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. If you find yourself getting beat up, maybe it's because you're not putting your armor on. Amen. By the way, the battle is mostly in the mind. It is the battlefield. It's the battlefield. These seven sons of Sceva, they had no authority. And they're like the modern day exorcists today. They're like the modern day charismatic movement and the, and the modern day Roman Catholic exorcists. They have no authority to do what they're doing. And they don't cast devils out of anybody. They probably impart more than they cast anything out. Right? Because they don't have the true gospel. The Bible says if they're not saved, then they have this spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience. So you have lost people that have the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience inside of them. Jesus said it. Can Satan cast out Satan? Right. <laughs> That's what they do. Right? You and I, we know that biblical deliverance comes from the gospel. What was Paul whole, Paul's whole aim? To preach the gospel. You want to deliver men from devils? Preach the gospel to them. Jesus just went out and preached everywhere that men should repent, and people and, right. and devil-possessed people came to him, and the devils cried out, saying, Thou art the Christ, the Son of the living God. He didn't go looking for those devils. They always came to him. And by the way, I said this when we first started street preaching because it was told to me and it was so true. You start preaching on that street and all the devils come out. They come out of everywhere. I'll never forget, like I told you guys, I've said it a million times, but every time I, the first time we preached in Northfield, I was the craziest thing I'd ever seen in my life. Man, we were down there preaching downtown. I don't know if it was Paul preaching or who it was, but maybe it was Russ at that time. But we were, him and, oh yeah, it was him and I, we were preaching downtown there. And man, I'm telling you what. I never seen anything like it in my life. This big, like 300 pound uh, sodomite dude was skipping like a girl down the sidewalk, like screaming at the top of his lungs. And people were coming out of bars wanting to fight us. People, I mean, I was like, I was like, finally, I've been looking for people for years in this town. Now is this all I had to do and they'd come out? You knock on their door, they wouldn't answer it. So I was like, when I started street preaching here, I was like, yeah, now you all got to see us. And we ain't leaving now either. <laughs> We're staying right here now. You wouldn't answer your door. Right? But true deliverance is salvation. Paul showed that. Paul didn't do anything fancy. You don't see Paul having these deliverance sessions. He's not having these deliverance meetings. Right? Paul's not casting out devils. Paul's not taking his... his his suit coat and swinging it around and, and throwing glory up to the upper bowl. You right? right? Paul's not playing Street Fighter and, right? Paul's not doing it. What is he doing? He's preaching the gospel. You preach the gospel, you'll, the devils will be around, but they'll have no power. God will deliver men. He does it by the preaching of the gospel. Paul reminds us that the preaching of the gospel is the power of God unto salvation. That's true deliverance, to be saved by grace through faith. And that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God, not of works, as any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath before ordained that we should walk in them. I like that song they sing in the junior churches before, He's still working on me. To make me what I ought to be. Amen. And he's still working on you. And me. Father in heaven, Lord, thank you. Thank you for the gospel. Thank you for it being the power of God. Thank you for the simplicity that is in Christ Jesus alone. And you commanded, Lord, look and live. Look and live. And we thank you that you've made salvation so very simple for us. And your grace so magnificent for us. That Lord, be it, be it someone that's lost, that's never been saved. Or be it someone who is struggling with their assurance. All they must do is the same thing that anyone must do. And that's look to you. 
and you will strengthen them. You will give them hope. You will give them power. You will give them your might for the fight. You'll lift them up, Lord. Thank you, Father, for your grace and mercy. Thank you, Jesus. And thank you to the Holy Ghost of God to seal us into the day of redemption. One day, Lord, we'll be home and our battle will be over. But dear Father, strengthen us now as we fight the good fight of faith and lay hold on eternal life. Bring your saints back safely, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. <laughs>